So we're going to get started. We have a lot going on tonight that's going to be really fun. Uh, so I want to get started with the formal program, but do please keep letting us know in the question and answer what you're thinking. Uh, we want this to be as much as possible a two-way discussion, so it's not just us pushing out information to you. Uh, tonight, we also just want to give you an opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, so this is a webinar series. Uh, so this is the Make It Big webinar series presented by Autodesk that also is connected with a really fun design challenge that we're gonna talk about tonight that is inspired by a real life project that football star James Devlin is currently working on right now. So before we get started, I just wanted to thank the different organizations that uh, have collaborated with us on this webinar episode tonight. Uh, so first I would like to thank uh, the Boston chapter of the National Organization uh, of Minority Architects. I also would like to thank the Boston Society for Architecture, Wentworth Institute of Technology, and Albadas, uh, which is an educational nonprofit. So like I said before, this is episode two, Ask an Architect. I'm gonna tell you later on how you can find episode one, the recording as well, if you're just joining us for the first time. So welcome. Uh, so how to participate? Again, we want to make this as uh, engaging as possible, for you, we want you to have the opportunity to ask questions and we want to you know, be able to share your voices and share your ideas. Uh, but in order to protect your privacy, you'll notice that the chat has been somewhat disabled in a way so that you cannot chat with other participants. However, you can use the chat to, to chat with panelists. Uh, I also wanted to let you know that real humans are <laughs> answering the chat. So Matthew Dal Dalton, who's the adult human, in this photo, uh, who is the community manager uh, for Autodesk Education. We'll be answering uh, your comments or your ideas uh, in the chat. So feel free to chat with Matthew and also Donald Bell, uh, who manages marketing communications for Autodesk Education. So he will also be answering your questions or you know, replying to uh, some of your ideas in the chat. In addition, Jenny, who you've already heard from, uh, is the content development manager for Autodesk Education. So throughout the episode, we will, uh, you know, after the first presentation, we're gonna ask you if you have any questions for the presenters, for example. So please try to keep those sort of questions that you want us to kind of ask out loud to the presenters you would like for us to share, you know, out loud during the webinar, please uh, share those in the question and answer. So you should see those three icons at the bottom. So uh, I also just wanted to introduce myself. So my name is Kellyanne Mahoney. I'm a youth program specialist at Autodesk. Uh, I am on the construction team at Autodesk, but I also really uh, work really closely with our friends on the education team. I also would like to introduce Heather. So Heather, do you want to say hi? Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for joining tonight. It's great to be here. Uh, so I work at Autodesk. I'm the product manager for Formit. I'm also an architect by training, and then I transitioned to work in um, designing software and 3D modeling apps for architects. So it's great to be here. Thank you, Heather. And if you go back to episode one, the recording from episode one, you'll also see a really wonderful demonstration of Formit. Uh, we also demonstrated Tinkercad, uh, but Heather put that together and it's really great. Uh, so thank you, Heather, for joining too, because later on, if you've been working on using Formit on the design challenge, you'll have the opportunity to ask Heather questions specifically about Formit. Uh, I also wanted to introduce James Devlin, uh, who is a three-time Super Bowl champion. He was a player on the New England Patriots, uh, and he's also a wonderful innovator. Uh, and I wanted to give him uh, just a chance to say hi uh, and to just tell us a little bit about the project that he's working on, which is the basis for uh, this really cool design challenge. Thanks, Kelly. And yeah, hi, everyone. My name is James Devlin. I a former New England Patriot recently retired last spring. Um, seems like forever ago because 2020 took so long. But uh, happy 2021, everyone. And uh, yes, yeah, so after my football career ended, um, I was kind of weighing out some possibilities on my end. And I went to Brown University. I studied mechanical engineering. And uh, really, I wanted to marry um, the, the studies I did in college with my love for athletics and sports performance and sports medicine, really, um, because we, you know, as professional athletes, we're afforded some of the best 
uh, facilities, you know, known to man. So I was trying to figure out an, a way to provide that, um, you know, using my entrepreneurial spirit, provide that to the masses. And uh, so that's what I'm trying to do. And that's Autodesk partner with me to, to create this, uh, this awesome design challenge. And there's been some absolutely awesome applications already. Um, you know, it's really inspiring stuff. And I'm just floored every time I, I click on all those applications and just, you know, sort through them. It, it's, uh, it's insane, the creativity I've seen. Um, and really just the ingenuity. It's, it's really great to see from, uh, from our youth. So um, just keep on keep on submitting those things and help me out. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to, you know, getting collecting them all and combing through them and picking a winner, or three. <laughs> thank you, James. You provided a lot of inspiration for students, so we thank you for that. And also tonight, as we talk a little bit more about the design challenge, you can also ask questions to James as well. Uh, you can even think of James as your client because he really is. I know these James and I have been emailing. I send him when there's new, uh, really good new entries. He's been looking at them and really finding inspiration uh, for his uh, gym that he's designing. So thank you for that. And thank you, James. Thank you. So uh, we will later on have a, a panel uh, with architects. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about their backgrounds and their stories and how they got into architecture and what it's like to be an architect. Uh, so please do stick around for that later because um, it's gonna be a wonderful panel with wonderful architects. Um, takeaways for today. So we do want you to take away some knowledge and some skills from this webinar. Uh, so one of the things that you're going to do tonight is to find out, or this afternoon, if you're on the West Coast, <laughs> is to find out how college students are applying their architecture skills to support their community. We're also going to meet some architects and other designers who will share their personal stories and their visions for the future. And last but not least, please stick around at the end so that you can ask questions and to help make your first to help make your first Make It Real Student Design Challenge a success. Uh, so with this series, we really wanted to think about how we could expose you through following James's real life journey through the fields of architecture, eventually into engineering and ultimately construction. Uh, so right now we're really kind of focusing on architecture and the design challenge that we'll talk about later uh, really is asking you to kind of think like an architect. But one of the things that we also want to convey to you through this series is how architecture, engineering, and construction intersects with one another, and also how uh, professionals in these industries are being asked more and more to collaborate more closely with each other in order to build a better world uh, for all of us. So I'm really excited. Uh, next, we're going to hear from some students at the Wentworth Institute of Technology, who are led by their wonderful professor, Robert Trumbor. Uh, who have actually applied skills, even though they're architecture students, have applied skills from all three of these disciplines into this really awesome prototype that expresses their vision for a cool idea that they want to be able to bring to the city of Boston where they're studying. So from here, I'd like to uh, hand the mic over to our students from the Wentworth Institute of Technology. Thank you, Kelly, and hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, my name is Jenna, and today we are with Sam Herrick and Jake Terragrosen. You'll be hearing from them after. Um, the work you're going to be seeing is from myself and their groups, led by Rob Trumbor and our other professor, Matt Arsenal, a list of so many other wonderful peers that we got to work with on our project. Um, so our project, we were making a design initiative for the uh, surrounding areas near us. And these are some of the things that we talked about were, how did we begin in our design thinking process? How did, what were our goals for the design in the end? And who are we impacting? What are the neighborhoods and the students that we're gonna be bringing these designs to? So um, we started our research in the COVID-19 pandemic in their, our response. And our class was given a project to design um, a learning space or a maker space that would be helpful for these students um, in these areas to be able to learn, create um, while being socially distanced after and during the pandemic. So our class broke up into three different teams, um, a components thinking methodology, prefabrication and kit of parts. And I think Sam is gonna talk next about some of those things. 
All right. Hi, everybody. It's nice to meet you. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how important it was for all of us um, in this class to sort of really engage with the students that we were actually designing for. Um, all right, so we did a little bit of research on the neighborhoods that are going to be surrounding Boston. Um, so the main ones that we focused on were Dorchester and Roxbury, but we're going to get to Roxbury here in a second. Um, this is a little bit of the um, statistics that we had found about Dorchester. Uh, Jenna, do you want to get into this a little bit for me? Yes. So the population for Dorchester, um, which is Boston overall, was 19%. And we looked at the kids over there that were about um, age five to 17, and that was 22% of their population were under 18. Um, so after that, we looked into kind of the education um, and the diversity that that um, part of the city brought and how that would be impactful in our design afterwards. So like Sam said, we then looked at Roxbury, um, which had a similar popula um, population, but it's actually only 9% of Boston's overall population. Um, same thing, we looked at kids age five to 17 and looked at their education and their diversity background um, overall and what kind of things that we can be bringing to them as well. Um, so looking at kind of one of the sites that we looked at in Roxbury, which is on New Heath Street, kind of in correlation to where we go to school at Wentworth over in the annex, um, side and you'll hear about some other people that we worked with um, in the Wentworth quad um, right after this when Sam gets into kind of the people that we were collaborating and the students um, we were going to be impacting the most. All right so now I'll talk about the group of students that we actually met with. Um, so the the year of the program that we actually met with they were um, from a group called year 13 which is run by Digital Ready um, and these are students that are um, recently high school graduates that are looking at um, getting into a, an architecture field in college. Um, so each team met with them individually and sort of got um, an inside look on their design strategies for what we were actually designing. Um, so as you can see here, this is this was my group's actually um, intervention when we met with the group um, of students from year 13. Um, we took our design and made these little um, cardboard sort of um, activities for each student and they could sort of, you know, take the architectural knowledge and the construction knowledge that they have um, so far in their education and really sort of play around with us and our design. And, you know, we, we took directly what they gave us and that how it, that is how it helped um, influence what we are going to keep designing in the future. So this was another group strategy. They decided to do a survey, um, but our uh, friend Jake is going to get into their project a little bit here in a few minutes. Um, and then here's Jenna's group. Jenna, do you want to talk about this for a second? Sure. So we did something similar um, from Jake and Sam's, but we used a game board almost um, with the panel typologies that you'll hear about later in um, my part of the presentation. But we let the students look at how um, their design thinking would actually be forming the actual architecture and the shape of the learning space that they would want. Okay, so now you're going to hear from um, each of us college students. Um, we um, were each project managers actually for our groups. Uh, we're going to sort of talk about our actual designs and how we got where we are now. All right, so I'm going to start off. My group's um, project was called Q. Um, and so Q means um, like a like if you talk with people and you sort of get like a visual Q, you know, if you're if they're upset or something like that, you can sort of then um, determine your next steps. So we sort of took that strategy between the connection of people um, and that's how we designed um, the specific systems within our um, learning space. So our main concept was to inspire community engagement through a tessellation aggregation strategy while providing cues for construction, collaboration and learning. All right, so these um, next two slides are gonna be images of what our learning space actually looked like. Um, so my group felt it was very important for each student to have their own um, specific personal space. Um, so each um, learning space is about 120 square feet. Um, so it's perfect space for one person. And then this, uh, these two images are a plan and a section of our learning space. So a plan is if you were to um, physically cut um, the structure in half, 
and you would sort of get a look onto the inside of what the building looks like. Same with the section, but you're cutting it um, horizontally instead of vertically. All right, so these were the different systems of our learning space that I had briefly talked about earlier. Um, there, these groups were um, pretty large for us. So each group was made of eight people. So this was how you know we were able to um, design all of these systems in a semester. Um, so you know the key um, systems of any structure are the floor, um, the actual structure itself, um, the walls, and the roof itself. Um, so we also felt it was very important that our learning space was completely customizable, um, which you'll see in this next slide. Um, so it also was important for us to meet with the kids from year 13 because we wanted to get an inside look on what they would want their pod to actually look like. So their learning space is completely customizable. Um, and these are the different panels that they could choose from um, so they could um, design the outside of their pod or learning space as well. All right, and then here are a few renderings or um, real life images of what the learning space would look like. Um, here are a few of them, you know, aggregated together on a site. All right, and then here's another image of if you were to um, um, walk past the learning spaces on site as well. And then we were actually very lucky. Um, our professor Rob Trumbor made it um, very easy for all of us to um, sort of build a one-to-one -one scale mock-up model of each of our learning spaces. So my team and I um, decided to build a model of two of our pie pieces. So um, pretty much we were just cutting our learning space in half and this is a one-to-one -one scale. Um, this is all made of plywood um, and a lot of the pieces were CNC milled, but you will see um, a bunch of other projects that are gonna be um, in a similar strategy. Hi, uh, so uh, my project was called uh, Imagination Initiative and Innovation, which is uh, iCubed. Um, iCubed utilizes a Japanese style wood joinery for visible representations of connections. Uh, this is because uh, the learning space itself is intended to be constructed uh, by the students who will be using the space. Uh, the best way I can describe this is a scaled up version of Legos. That you can see here we have uh, these are two hook joints coming together with a uh, column coming in on top of them uh, called a, a finger joint. Uh, iCube gives uh, students the tools for creative freedom. Uh, the, the idea is that they would build their ideal work environment, which includes indoor and outdoor spaces, uh, thanks to hinging walls that open to the outdoors. Uh, this interior, uh, uh, this interior uh, rendering here uh, shows uh, collapsible walls that uh, students can use to uh, create a more intimate space or a more or a group setting, depending on how they feel uh, learning is easiest for them. Uh, here's a detail showing how the uh, hinging wall works. Uh, we have a, a hinge here that swings open. And uh, this is the uh, construction of the wall. Uh, thanks to adjust adjustable footings, uh, iCubed uh, can handle inclines, which allows it to expand potentially indefinitely in the X and Y directions. Uh, each square of the uh, I cubed is a uh, six by six foot by six foot square, which uh, in a COVID setting would be uh, one cube per person. Uh, here again is a uh, showing a, a section of the uh, site, uh, showing the uh, capabilities of the adjustable footings, uh, handling the uh, change in elevation. Uh, here's just a, a side elevation to show uh, how we uh, accomplish the shed style roof. Uh, the interior dimension uh, of the ceiling height rather is uh, six foot 10 uh, on its, uh, on its uh, smallest and uh, the shed roof increases that height. So even taller people uh, can exist inside the, uh, the I cubed. Uh, here's just an aerial uh, showing, uh, uh, showing 
uh, the spaces being used, the use indoor and outdoor spaces, as well as uh, benches and exterior plants. This is meant to be just a large learning environment uh, for you know a community to utilize and expand upon however they see fit. And uh, here is just uh, some pictures of us constructing inside of our, uh, our academic building. Uh, there's me on the ladder, um, screwing in some uh, pieces, some wood joinery in the uh, roof. And here's some uh, photos of the space being used. Uh, we put some furniture and there's a collapsible uh, wall partition right there, as well as uh, you know some photos without people in them. All right, and my group was called PlyPod off of the pod-like nature of the learning um, places you're seeing and also because all of them are made out of plywood. Um, so my group, um, like I said before, we used a panel typology, um, much like Sam's to make the space um, as customizable as possible for the students. Um, so we kind of had a catalog for them to pick and choose from that went with the game board that you saw. And any piece that they put in the game board, we would then take and use their form um, to then make into the act architecture. So like you saw before, the activity really did go into the architecture for all of ours. Um, so looking a little bit more, um, this is one of the forms that they created that we then went off of from the game. So here, like you saw, um, heard Sam explain um, a plan on the left and on the right is a little animation about how from the ground up, you really would see the design um, come to life from the construction process. Um, here is a section of our pod. Um, these are kind of like two of the pods that we then put together um, to create one learning space. Um, and from some of the pictures in the end, you'll see um, the piece on the left actually coming to life, which will be really exciting to see. Um, this is another form that the students had given to us um, that we made into um, a VR representation. So we took this model and after this, you'll actually be able to see um, a photo of it put into our parking lot that we then were able to kind of go through with our phones and our laptops. So here's that image of the pod, um, the learning space rather, in the parking lot um, right next to our academic building. And like I said, we could go in with our phones and kind of be able to really see the nitty gritty um, of what was going on inside, which is a really fun activity for us to do. Here are some more of the detail oriented um, factors that we looked into. Um, myself, Sam and Jake, all of our groups had to uh, create a full construction document um, set of all of the things that would be essential in order to see and see and mill and craft all of these spaces to be actually um, come to life in a community. Here's some of the um, detail um, models rather that we tried to figure out before um, going into the larger scale process. So we kind of took all of the detail drawings that we thought of and really tested to see if our design processes processes were going to come to life in the end before we kind of made the bigger jump to this scale. And here's our finished pod. Um, we had a, a much smaller model inside the larger model, which was kind of fun to see, um, seeing that our original design really did come to life and that we could place it right on the shelf where it belonged. So all of the designs that you just saw, like I said, we um, created construction documents for them to actually be fully realized one day. Um, and we really do hope that one day we can be bringing these spaces into communities around us and to really be helping students um, learn and have a future um, within any kind of field that they're looking for. Thank you guys. Thank you. I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for sharing your story. And one of the reasons why I thought it would be really interesting for students who are working on the design challenge to see your story is that you employed a lot of the skills that we're asking for students to demonstrate through the challenge. So you use design thinking, you really thought about your end users and really empathize with them and really, you know, worked hard through your activities to, you know, ask questions and really kind of get to, you know, what would be the best experience for them through the structure. You really use design to make a difference. You also demonstrated modularity, exploded views, you know, sections, red rendering. So not only just having this really imaginative vision, but really thinking about how to make it work. 
Uh, and also then to tell your story in such a really wonderful entrepreneurial way in which you were able to use renderings and, you know, all types of, um, you know, even when you talked about VR, you know, ways of really kind of bringing that experience to life before you actually did and then you actually built it. So I just want to say thank you to our Wentworth students. Uh, and I'm wondering, Jenny, are there any questions for the students before we move on to the next section? Yes, we actually do have a couple questions. Um, this one came in when Samantha was speaking. Um, whenever the designs were constructed, did you discuss the materials and the advantages, disadvantages of using different materials? Yes, we did actually. Um, so I can sort of use um, my team for the example. Um, so our structure is designed in a way that, um, you know, a, a different material would have been more desirable, like at the beginning, um, Rob can also attest to this. We wanted to make our structure out of steel, but because this project is supposed to be, you know, um, cost friendly and it's supposed to be easily deployable and like easy to make and build, um, just the feasibility of having any other material than like the material that we could actually get our hands on during the semester was a bit hard for us to sort of um, wrap our heads around because of, you know, at the end of the day, it all comes down to, um, you know, feasibility and, and budgeting, unfortunately, and, um, you know, different systems thinking and all that fun stuff. Um, so, I mean, like Jenna, was, Jenna and Jake were saying earlier, if we take these projects further, they may be explored in different materials. Um, but just in this moment right now, like the materials that we could get our hands on was what we used. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question. This wasn't for anyone in particular, so if I could maybe have a volunteer from our presentation crew. Um, if you've just learned how to use a software, what are some ways for you to become better and more proficient? I would say just have fun with it. Give yourself little challenges if you think there's something that you're not particularly good in. Um, make yourself use that software 10 times more. Um, you're not going to love it, but in the end, you'll have a brand new tool under your belt to be able to say that you can use um, and you'll be able to bring it into your designs and into just kind of everyday life where you can use it to where you see fit. It's so exciting to, to design something digitally like you did and then to, to bring it to life and, and make it real. So that was super cool. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're going to move on to our panelists next. Um, but do, if there are more questions for the students at the end, uh, we, we will have some time at the end for question, more question and answer. So thank you so much for participating and, and keep those questions coming in the question and answer and also continue chatting with Donald and Matthew uh, as well, because I'm sure that they are enjoying being able to engage with young people who are innovators too. Uh, so next we're gonna move on to our panel. Uh, so this is your opportunity for First, we'll ask the architects some questions, uh, and then you can also ask questions as well. Uh, so just to introduce our panel, um, first, uh, we have Elise Ayung, who is an interior designer and associate at Gensler. Uh, she's also an executive member of Boston's chapter for the National Organization uh, of Minority Architects, uh, and she helped pull this wonderful panel together. So I just want to thank Elise for that, uh, Elise is a creative and interior designer based in Boston. Her career has included projects of varying scales and project types from residential, higher ed, healthcare, and workplace at small, medium, and large firms. Landing her in her most current role as an associate designer at Gensler, Boston, focusing on workplace design. She is passionate, passionate not only about the spaces she creates, but the impact her lived experiences and cultured background can and should have on design and the built environment. Next, we have Gerard Georges, uh, who is the Director of Architecture for Build Health International. He, is, uh, he has over 27 years of experience in healthcare planning, design and project management, fluent in French, Haitian Creole, and a bit of Spanish, these languages and love for travel led him to work on notable projects in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean. Next, we have Sibone Diaz Sanchez, who is an architect and Rose Fellow at OPCO. Uh, she also works in the Boston area, and she works to understand how architecture and design can best serve and reflect communities. She is currently working at Opportunity Communities a community development corporation. 
Her work focuses on affordable housing development and community building because they are inherently connected. And last, we also have uh, Dr. Nikisa, or I call her Dr. Nikki Albors. Um, she is the president and founder of Albaraz, uh, which is an education nonprofit. Uh, she's also an associate professor in civil and interdisciplinary engineering. So Dr. Nikki is actually not an architect, but she's a civil engineer. And one of the reasons why I thought it would be great to include her voice in this panel is because particularly in the de design phase, architects and engineers oftentimes work together in order to, to make the buildings that they're designing work. Um, so prior to starting her academic and, and administrative leadership career, Dr. Albors worked in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry. Uh, her expertise is in sustainability of the built environment. Oops, so, so that's for what's next. But you can continue to type questions uh, as we are asking questions to the panel. Uh, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now so that we can see everyone's faces. And I'm gonna go into gallery view on my screen and you might wanna do that as well. Uh, so to begin, um, I wanted to ask the panel um, just to sort of introduce yourself a little bit more than I just did. And we're also curious about what were your interests as a kid and how did you find your way into architecture? It would also be great for you to talk a little bit more about what your job is. So who wants to start off? I can start. Thank you, Elise. Hi, everyone. I am Elise Young. Um, I was born and raised in Boston, specifically Dorchester. Um, and I am currently an interior designer at an architecture firm here in Boston, um, Gensler. I actually did not really want to be an architect or a designer when I was younger. I knew I wanted to be some type of artist. Um, and as a kid, I was constantly playing with like boxes, building forts. And in inherently, my, my father uh, had a construction business and my mother also worked in construction. So it's probably evident that I would have went into this field. <laughs> um, but I was surrounded a lot by architecture and buildings. Um, and my mom would always bring home magazines for me to flip through. And through that, I, I sort of found my way into architecture and the arts. Um, and that's kind of what I focused on. And I, and I went to an art school actually, because I thought I was gonna be an art, te art teacher. So I had a lot of uh, things that I wanted to be and do, but um, I think naturally my talents kind of landed me into the architecture world. Um, and now I'm currently focused on workplace design. So I, I design spaces that people work in, um, that they wanna be in every single day. Um, now we're sort of working from home, um, but when we all get back to work, uh, th those are the spaces that I focus on. So hi, I'm really happy to speak with you guys today. Thank you so much, Elise. Gerard, you have the built environment in your family background as well. Did you want to go next? Sure, why not? Um, my name is Gerard Georges. Um, I'm currently the director of architecture at Build Health International. Uh, I grew, I was actually born in Haiti, um, grew up for a few years in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Montreal, New York, Miami, and then finally landed in Boston. Uh, my father was a civil engineer, uh, Dr. Nikisa, but uh, like he, my wanted, father. <laughs> he wanted me to be the one and I did not. Um, when we were young, because we traveled so much, our parents never really bought us toys. So they would just give us boxes and paper and things like that and say, make your own toy. So I was really interested in train sets, making things, uh, and that just led to this natural creativity and in, in inquiry about spaces. And I was fascinated by light and how the light enters a space and it forms the space and how it animates texture. At a very young age, uh, probably in sixth grade, I knew that I wanted to be an architect, um, which has led me into healthcare architecture because my father subsequently passed away and I was really interested in creating spaces that enriched the experience that people had to, to go through when they were in hospitals. And uh, because of my travels, I was really interested in how to provide dignity in healthcare systems for people who live in resource limited areas. So we do a lot of work in Africa, in, um, in Haiti, in Dominican Republic and uh, Papua New Guinea of all places. So um, it's just a lot of uh, architecture and design can take you many places. So um, 
you can broaden your your thoughts about what that means. Very cool. Dr. Nikki, you want to go next? Sure. Um, so I was born in Iran and raised in Dubai, um, moved to Boston 21 years ago for school and then ended up staying in Boston. Um, and then I entered industry and lived in Hawaii for four years working on a transit project. And that was the place where I really felt that I had to have a positive impact in our environment, being an engineer. Um, and then when I came back to the East Coast, I really started to dive in and get more uh, industry experience around sustainability, around the built environment sustainability, and then also starting my nonprofit, which focuses on engineering education and sustainability research. Um, so just like, um, Gerard, my father was also a civil engineer and my mom was a business owner. So that's how I got interested in this industry. I mean, I remember being on construction sites and around engineering and architecture discussions and arguments <laughs> based on you know arguments around their design. So um, that's how I, I came into the field. So thank, thank you. you, Dr. Nikki. Stephen A. Can you all hear me correctly? Mm -hmm. Good? Okay. Yes. Um, what an honor to be on this panel um, and to see all that student work. I just want to acknowledge that. That was beautiful. Um, as a kid, uh, so I was, I was raised, since we're talking about where we were raised a little bit, um, I was raised by a gender justice grassroots um, activist of a mother and an arts administrator. And so my childhood kind of was really focused on the arts and I actually grew up thinking I was gonna dance flamenco. I'm originally from San Antonio in Texas. And I you know, went into architecture, realizing that there was a strong connection between dance and architecture, You know, similar to a couple of the other comments earlier, it's about acknowledgement of space, right? It's, architecture is about movement, it's about choreography um, around space and so, it wasn't that far of a jump. I think some people were really surprised in that in that move. And then um, I ended up writing my my thesis um, on dance and architecture and their inherent um, connection. Right, architecture um, is about humanity. And so, as a you know, I am a licensed architect. I do live in Boston, but I I moved here for something called the Enterprise Rose Fellowship. Um, I'll drop a a link in the chat in a second. Um, it's a fellowship that, that allows for architects and now artists and landscape architects to work for various nonprofits that um, vast majority of them do do community development um, for affordable housing. So right now I'm, I'm actually, I was thinking about how I can hire Q, um, Samantha's group talking about the, the way in which she spoke about community engagement, because I'm working with Mass Design, a, a local architecture firm that does work around the world um, on a park in Roxbury called Oasis. And I'll, I'll drop a link there, but it's in the middle of affordable housing. And then I also do work on affordable housing in, um, uh, sorry, excuse me, Chelsea Everett and Revere through the neighborhood developers within OPCO. Um, so I'm, I'm an architect turned affordable housing developer and I, I hire architects and I coordinate with them. Um, but a bigger part of my work is actually really infusing humanity and the work of our resident services within our team, within our offices and, and our community organizers and community voices into the affordable housing world. Awesome. Um, it's just also great to hear how, you know, just particularly in the city of Boston, I noticed that the architecture community is so tight and connected in such a wonderful network uh, of professionals. So um, it's a really great uh, career to, to enter into. So the next question that I have is how has the field changed since you started your career? Or are there tools or skills you learned in college that you don't use anymore? Um, so who wants to take that question? Um, I'll take it on. Okay. Thank you, um, I'm probably a lot older than I look. So when I first started, uh, architecture was really about the craft of drawing by hand and building by hand and expressing um, your ideas and your creativity through this medium. Um, and then it became digital. So there's a lot of information that travels a lot faster and is more accessible for people to use now where before you actually had to, if you were thinking about a detail of how something goes together, you actually have to draw it out 
uh, in order to make it work and then do some research to put it together. Um, so I, th I think that's something that um, would be helpful for anyone who's interested in pursuing this career is really sketching things out and just trying to figure out how things get put together. So there's a big change in how you put uh, details together. Thank you, Gerard. Dr. Nikki, you wanted to answer this too? Sure, yes. Um, so from the perspective of being a female minority in engineering, uh, back when I started, I felt that there was more of a stereotyping in terms of like what an engineer looks like and how they should behave, so to speak. Uh, and I felt that it was more conservative of an industry. Um, but now it has definitely changed. Uh, they're embracing innovation, disruption, shattering of stereotypes. There is more work to be done for sure. Um, but it has really come a long way from when I started in industry 17 years ago. Thank you, Dr. Nikki. Uh, so the next question is, what are some skills you use today that one wouldn't expect would be important to being an architect? Uh, Elise, did you have a response to that question? Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't even know if this is really a skill, but I would say that um, I've become a really, really great observer. Um, as I've, I've worked a little bit longer, you tend to now observe the spaces that you're in and how people interact in them. I think when I was younger it was it was about like the buildings look so cool and it feels so great to be in the space but um I think one of the the great skills that I would I would say that has really helped me is observing how people and humans move through the space um what are they using it for what are the feelings and the emotions that they are feeling when they're in the space um and then just like textures and lighting um and the way the light reflects off surfaces so just becoming a really good observer. <laughs> so you're someone who's a people watcher too. <laughs> it's, it's a great career to enter into. Uh, Elise, or sorry, that was Elise Sibone. <laughs> sorry, you wanted to go next? Sure, I, you know, you mentioned earlier soft skills and I think there can be kind of an intense discussion that comes out of um, that word, you know, sometimes being discredited in value. Um, I waited tables in Chicago after I graduated I'm proud to say I was an amazing server. Um, and I learned a lot about people. So similar to Elise talking about kind of observations, um, I really learned a lot about communication. And I, I know there were also some, you know, at the beginning of the panel talks about what you need. And I think patience and perseverance really came out of that, but also customer service skills. Um, I think that experience had direct impact on my work and I talk about it a lot in, in kind of situations like this, scenarios like this, because I think it's important to, to credit those experiences because they are valid. Um, you also brought up empathy and I think that there's, there's a really um, serious problem with architecture not valuing empathy. Um, and I think too, you know, when we talk about the work, when we talk about the history, when we talk about any kind of approach, um, we need to be really clear about language. And so I've actually spent a lot of my time thinking about language and I'll put another link in the chat. Um, thinking about how we are being critical of language and the origin of language within our work and, and in some ways how that language can be quite violent. Um, and so that's something I wasn't expecting um, I also think a lot about justice in my work and I'm a part of a group that's designed as protest. Um, so thinking about how architecture and design is actually um, a move toward justice and liberation. So many interesting connections and places to, um, different places to go with architecture. Thank you, Stephen A. Uh, Gerard? Um, so the skill that I would say um, are really important that I found is, uh, and I think this was mentioned before, is communication. And what I mean by that is really understanding how to tell the story of your design idea and how to listen and then speak back to either the client or the user or the practitioner about their goals and ideas for that space. So it's taking that information reinterpreting it and be able to explain it back to them so that they can understand. And, and you're, you're expressing your vision through words, but also through drawings. Thank you, Gerard. I know that some, some of my architecture friends are some of the best listeners that I know as well. Uh, so good listening. I also saw an architect once solve a problem that was happening by going to the, the whiteboard and drawing it out for everybody who is <laughs> in conflict. So conflict resolution, I feel like is another 
uh, un unknown skill of architects. Uh, Dr. Nikki, you had a response to this question too. Uh, yes, so um, a skill that you wouldn't expect you would need or you would want to use in the industry, especially around engineering and architecture, um, and I'm going to speak to the engineering part, um, is languages. Languages help you connect with your team members, your client, your end user, um, and you get to see things from different perspectives, being immersed in different cultures. So languages was definitely a skill that I didn't think I was going to use as an engineer, um, but it has really gone a long way to create rapport and connect with team members. And especially now, all projects are global. Your team members are global. So having that diversity of thought, critical. It's such an important skill that I wish I had. I studied Latin in high school, which is not a lot of Latin speakers <laughs> these days. So such a, such a great asset to have. Um, the next question is to describe a challenge you faced in your career or schooling and how you overcame it. Shall I go? Is it okay? Yes. Sure, you're up next. <laughs> had many challenges, but picked one. Um, I think the biggest challenge throughout was self-doubt and self-confidence in my ideas. So for all of the students and teachers joining us today, I think you wanna be yourself, you wanna be bold. Uh, don't lose your individuality and believe in your ideas and believe in yourself. So that was like the biggest challenge, still ongoing. It's still ongoing, it's still a work in progress. <laughs> yes. Stephen A, did you have a response to this question? I did, and I think, you know, Dr. McGee or, said, it, said it well. Um, I am an architect, and I'm also Latina, and that really creates challenges daily. And so um, I would echo those same thoughts. There's, there's a lot of self-doubt, and there's a lot of healing, too, as part of this work. And so I would say make time for yourself um, to create art for yourself, to create things for yourself and not just um, kind of responding to an extractive um, society that we, that we work and live in. Um, but I, I think some of the challenges, that, you know, again, we're talking about language, but also finding your community. And that's part of the reason why Boss Noma is represented here, right? I moved to Boston. Um, we didn't have a Noma in San Antonio, now we do. Um, and it's partnered with Austin. But um, I helped create a Latinos in Architecture Committee within the American Institute of Architects there and co-chaired that for a couple of years. And, it, and that really brought a lot of strength to the work um, because I realized I wasn't alone. And so I think reminding yourself that you're not alone um, in your challenges and being around people who remind you of that is important. And there's so many challenges, big problems that need to be solved within this industry. So that requires a diversity of perspectives in order to, to solve problems in a better way. So. Uh, we're so thankful for the uh, National Organization for Minority Architects, and we hope that maybe some of you who are on today might join that organization in the future, too. Um, so the next question, so imagine yourself as a high school student or a middle school student. Um, what should you be doing, if you could go back in time, uh, what should you be doing right now if you want to become an architect in the future? Um, I, I can answer. Um... If you are a middle school student or a high school student and you're interested in being an architect or even in the architectural field, I saw a few questions coming in, um, being interested in architecture, but maybe not architect, being an architect. Um, as I said earlier, I'm an interior designer who works at an architecture firm. So there are many different creative pathways um, into the field of architecture. So my first thing would I would say is really it's like, go on the internet, go on Pinterest, get magazines, really explore the creative fields that are out there that involve the built environment um, and just expand your knowledge. And, and don't think that architecture is just building buildings um, because it's more than that. It's uh, impacting your community, um, your neighborhoods, um, your local bodegas, your cafes, but it's also um, visuals and graphics and sculptures that you see in public parks. Um, so I would say just really ex expand your knowledge of what it means to be a creative and what it means to be a creative in the architecture field and um, start looking at schools, start early, start looking at what uh, programs are offered and see what is required for you to actually apply, see what scholarships are available. I think when I was in high school, I wish I knew more about the scholarships that were actually out there. Um, 
I kind of was just like loosely hanging out. And then my senior year, I was like, oh, I should probably figure out what I want to do with my life. Um, so don't do that if you have time. <laughs> um, and I would just say expand your knowledge and then really look at schools now and see what it takes to apply. And anything that you create, take photos of it because you, you're you probably going to need a portfolio. So take photos. Don't throw any of your artwork away. Um, it might be really, really useful to someone one day. Great advice. And we're going to be sharing Instructables later, which is a great way of documenting your projects as well, which is kind of what we're asking you to do through this challenge. Gerard? Yeah, can I just add one other thing? Of course. Um, architects love to share what they do. Um, contractors do as well. Engineers, um, maybe so. <laughs> but I would suggest if anyone has an opportunity to connect with an architect or a small firm or a construction company, just ask if they can do shadow an architect or shadow a designer for the day. Um, we've done that at my firm and it's amazing because it makes us think about what we do mm -hmm. through the eyes of the, the, the young person who's trying to understand. And I think it's a great win-win situation. So, you know, reach out to different firms, be professional and just say, you know, would it be possible to do half a day or a day just to follow and see what you do for the day? Great advice, Gerard. Thank you. Dr. Nikki? Uh, no, I have nothing to add to that. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, I think the shadow program is excellent. It's an excellent way to uh, immerse in the industry and learn from lots of professionals and also realize that there's a lot of interdisciplinarity of all of the disciplines, architecture, interior design, engineering. Um, so everything that's around us has been designed and it's all a mesh of disciplines. You. And Stephen A talked about dance as well. Stephen A, did yeah. you talk a little bit more about this question? Yeah, I think um, as a high school, middle school student, um, everything that's already been said, uh, but also going back to some of the student presentations, thinking about community and not just kind of what is needed for, for ego. Um, and I, I think that it's a, as a part of that work, understanding the history of spaces, whether that's interior design or I mean, however you work in civil engineering, um, thinking about the people that were there before you and the people that will be there kind of after um, your design is realized. So I, I support the least um, research. I mean, just like looking, get, getting exposed to, to images, but also getting exposed to voices. Um, is a really big part of the work. And if you're interested in policy, you know, this is a little extended, but um, policy impacts how we design spaces and how cities are designed. And there's a lot of, um, for better or worse, a lot of power in that. And I don't mean that necessarily as a positive, but it is important to think about the ways in which space is regulated. And even thinking about how you can keep people safe. Uh, as well in your space, yeah. which and is healthy. Oh, sorry, and that's something James is thinking about with his gym as well. Uh, so health and safety really important to the field. So my last question is my debate question. So you have to choose one or the other. <laughs> so the last question, and everyone can answer this one, uh, is architecture an art or a science? And you can explain why if you want. But if you had to choose one. Can I go first? Because I'm an outlier, because I'm yeah. an engineer. <laughs> Okay, um, so do I have to pick one? Because it's yes. really both. Yes, yes. you have to pick one. It's really both. <laughs> so I'm, okay, so given that I'm an engineer, I'm gonna go with the opposite of what you think I'm gonna pick. I think engineering is an art because engineers are also creatives. And when you look around, um, like thinking of just a bridge as an example, it's a highly technical um, asset, but you had to imagine it and to create it. So it, it comes from a place of imagination within some boundary conditions, um, but it's still a beautiful piece of art. So art. <laughs> nice. Thank you, Dr. Nikki. Anyone else want to chime in? Um, I'm going to say art because <laughs> I'm an artist first. Um, and I think that I say art because a lot of what we, we do, um, well, what I do comes from the art and I think about purpose. Um, and then I sort of weave into science when I want to, you know, figure it out. <laughs> but um, as a creative, I would, I would go with art. Thank you, Elise. Uh, I, I'm going to go 180 degrees from everyone and say, uh, although I am artistic, I paint, I do photography and sculpture. Um, it is a science in that there's 
there's a technical aspect of putting together a building or a space. You know, you have to understand how lighting works. What are the materials? Um, like if you're doing a gym, what kind of floor do you have? What are the sound acoustics associated with that space? Um, what, you know, what fire protection is required for that space? Uh, so there's all these technical aspects that goes into, you know, for instance, like I love cars. When I was a kid, I was drawing cars all the time and car designs, someone would say a uh, Pininfarina or, or Ferrari would be an art, but it's really a, a science that has the wrapping of art on top of it. So I would say it's it's the, ske the skeletons, the, the, the science, and then you can like put the icing on, which is the uh, art. It's a beautiful metaphor. Thank you, Gerard. Stephen A. Oh gosh, I know. Can, I'm gonna break the rules, Kellyanne. I know. I know you said you had to pick one, and when you when you wrote that, when I read that question, and as you say it, I, my answer is just yes. Um, <laughs> they both respond to people. They both respond to need, right? It is the study of people, and it's an expression of people. Mm -hmm. um, science is beautiful. And so I, I think there is, um, I think there is something to be said about a fundamental issue with trying to separate the two so often, right? Mm -hmm. um, architecture, you you need to be a generalist, right? You need to know a little bit about everything in design. And so I, I think to ignore art or science as part of your work is detrimental in any creative approach, whether that's for community or even for your for your own health as just in your soul. Um, you're always trying to see what's possible. So I'm I'm sorry, but I, I tend to <laughs> I tend to do that. And I mean I guess it's more art, but I, I don't know. I I think I just read it and I was like, yes, it, it is. Well I will forgive you because architects <laughs> are rule breakers, right? <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Sometimes. You gotta follow rules too. Often. Awesome. So next up, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to share my screen just to talk a little bit. I'm going to go quickly just a little bit about the contest itself for those of you who are new or those of you just to remind you about the contest. And then after that, we're going to go into uh, Jenny has been compiling a lot of your questions that you've been asking throughout. Um, a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of questions. So um, and we appreciate that, too. Um, so please, as I am just talking a little bit about the contest. Uh, please continue to ask questions uh, for the architects and designers, so also to the students, designers as well, in the question and answer. You might also think about it in this way too. So James is here. Uh, so you might even think about if James were your client, which he kind of is if you're competing in the contest, what questions would you have, either for the architects or even for him? And also just to remind you that Heather is here. So if you've been working through Formit, and you have some questions specifically about Formit. Also the Tinkercad team is here too. Uh, so please continue to ask us questions. Uh, just quickly to talk about um, Make It Big in the contest this year. So this is the fourth year of the Autodesk Make It Real Challenge. This year we're calling the challenge Make It Big in the webinar series Make It Big because we're thinking about how we can innovate in the built environment and particularly to help James uh, solve his a uh, problem that we'll talk about a little bit too. So address his design challenge that he's facing. Uh, so if you uh, want to check out the contest, the URL is at the bottom. So it's autodesk.com slash autodesk make it real. The deadline for this particular contest is January 31st, uh, but we will be launching another competition that's kind of more engineering focused in February. Um, so if you take a look at the web page itself, um, you'll see that the prize, so the prize is a $500 gift card. So that's there, there's pl plenty of information, context about how the, the contest is gonna be judged. You'll also see that we've had some awesome entries. James talked about this before, come in already. I think we have 26 now too, because we've got a great format entry today. Um, so you'll see that those are published as instructables. So if you don't know what that is, you can click on it and, and see what an instructable is. Uh, this is also just links to the prizes that you can win. Our friends at CDW have actually put together this cool uh, prize package for you. So there's all types of uh, cool prizes you can win that are about the equivalent of $500. Um, so happy to answer questions about that. Uh, you'll also see that we have a folder of resources uh, that you can use. So we are here to support you in the contest and we really do wanna see your most imaginative ideas. 
Uh, so just really quickly, so we are Autodesk, we make software for people who make things. So from smart cars to skyscrapers to infrastructure like bridges to blockbuster films and blockbuster video games, for example. Um, I just wanted to make clear to you that um, if you are interested in architecture, any of the careers that I just talked about, you do have free access as a student or as a teacher uh, to about 100 of our tools. Uh, so if you want to use Formit, for example, in your design challenge, you should, uh, you know, depending on what you see on this web page, uh, should have free access to it. Tinkercad is free for everyone, too. Uh, so uh, so I also just wanted to let you know that this is being recorded. Uh, so maybe if you're a teacher checking this out and you want to share the recording with your students, uh, if you go to the Autodesk Education YouTube page, uh, there is a playlist for this program. So we have our episode one is already there and this episode should probably be up uh, tomorrow or you know by Monday, I think at the latest. Uh, the design challenge, I'm not going to read everything here because uh, you can see this on the web page, but the first challenge is to design an aspect of the gym. So this is the gym that James had talked about earlier that he hopes to design and build. So just kind of similar to what you heard from the Wentworth students earlier, you want to do something to help to make a design to help James tell his story. So he is reimagining and designing a flexible gym space that promotes health and wellness for athletes like him who are recovering from serious injuries. Uh, how we are judging the contest, uh, we want to see your technical skills. Um, and it could be, you could be demonstrating technical skills using Tinkercad if that's where you are, uh, but you could also use, you know, Formit, which Heather has demonstrated and, and other tools that you can find on the web page. Uh, we want to see your innovation, so how imaginative can you be thinking about even the context in which, you know, James is designing this, it's in the COVID era, so, you know, how can you design a space that is flexible, that is safe, that, um, you know, promotes health and wellness, uh, how can you use design thinking similar to what the Wentworth students had demonstrated so uh, masterfully in the way that they had done surveys and conducted research in order to really think about uh, the end user who happened to also kind of be their client as well. Um, when you're thinking about this, this challenge with James, thinking about, you know, going back to episode one and really hearing that detailed story that he told about his vision and also thinking about who he wants to make the gym for. Uh, and also your presentation as well. So we saw a great example of how to present your design uh, from the Wentworth students earlier. This particular challenge is, is open to uh, residents of the United States and Canada, ages 13 to 19 years old. In the future, perhaps another contest will be open uh, more internationally, but for now this first challenge is just limited to to those countries, um, but you are always welcome to the webinars. Um, if you're not from the United States or Canada, um, I'm noticing that there, we have an international crowd tonight, so I'm really happy to see you all here, and maybe the next contest might be open uh, more broadly. Uh, so these are the prizes. So there's three grand prizes, a $500 gift card from CDW. Uh, also 10 runners up uh, will receive a really fun swag bag of uh, different you know, t-shirts and stickers and things like that. Uh, so just the schedule. So we've already done episode one, uh, which was in December. This is January. Know that in February, we're going to kind of shift. We're still going to live in the land of architecture, but we're going to shift a little bit more into engineering and really thinking about how to make James's design work. Um, we also will have another webinar like this with engineers in March. April, we're going to shift into thinking more about construction in the design challenge in April will be kind of more construction focused. I also just wanted to let you know before we get into the question and answer that the ACE Mentor Program is a great organization that I know that Boss Noma uh, works with. I know that I think Samantha from the, the Wentworth panel is also a mentor at Wentworth. So it's a great uh, place for you to organization to look at if particularly if you're in the United States to look for mentorship if you're interested in architecture, engineering and construction. So that is uh, Paulette's contact information and she's glad for you to contact her. Uh, we also will be sharing this, uh, a link to the slideshow with you uh, in the uh, resources as well. So back to the question and answer. <laughs> so Jenny, what do we have for questions? Yeah, we have a whole bunch. So I'll do my best to get through them. Um, this first one is for Gerard. 
Um, nowadays, there are many young students that want to learn how to design and make real their designs using 3D dimensionality or physically. Unfortunately, not many teachers around the world have the knowledge and the materials or economical situation to help all of them. As a director, are you aware of any programs that could help the teachers in this endeavor? I would say I mean, there, are, depending upon the location that you are in, there may or may not be programs, but um, what's accessible are um, TEDx talks, YouTube videos, and webinars that the American Institute of Architects um, prepares and puts out. There are also um, websites for manufacturers and they all have a lot of technical information that they could um, use. And now a lot of them is uh, via video. So you can learn uh, about how materials go together, uh, how details get uh, developed, and then uh, what types of materials are sustainable for the particular area that you're in. And um, yeah, I would say just a little bit of research. Okay, this is another question for you. Um, would you say that an aspiring architect should take construction classes in high school to understand the technical aspects? Absolutely, if the opportunity exists. I think there's something really magical about, and I hate to use that word, but that's the only thing that came to mind, about just understanding how things get put together. Because once you know that you're able to draw it or represent it in, in a manner that makes sense, instead of trying to draw a line that represents an idea, you're actually drawing thicknesses and connections and things like that. So yes. Great. Okay, this is for anyone on, on our panel. Um, what would you recommend for someone who struggles to be creative or original with their designs? I know, I know what I did. Um, what I did is I went to the library and nowadays it's everything's online. But I said, I'm gonna find five different designers or architects, their books that kind of inspire me. And then I'm just gonna to try to understand what it is about their work that, that inspired me. Um, and then the other thing is just walk around your neighborhood, your city, your town, and then just get inspired by simple little things. Yeah, um, I would say finding, um things outside of architecture that are sparking inspiration. Um, oftentimes I'll look at fashion, um, textile, textile design, um, and like Gerard said, walking around your community, your neighborhood. Um, that's, that's the way I tend to gain inspiration when I'm sort of feeling a creative block. Um, sometimes I'll also just like put it down and come back to it because sometimes it helps to have sort of a clear mind um, and then look at it with fresh eyes and new inspiration and something might come to you. That's great advice. Um, here's another question for anyone on our panel. Uh, what's an important example of how technology enhances design and how it limits design? Hmm. Who'd like to take that? Um, I'll say something quick. I think um, it, it definitely does both. <laughs> um, there are a lot of programs uh, that sometimes can hinder your design approach, um, but then there are also programs that can really, really help to tell the story of your design and, and actually uh, like help you figure things out. So I would say it's really exploring the different programs that are out there um, and allowing the programs and the platforms to help you, um, help you to design. Don't use it as a tool that is strictly doing the work for you, but see it as a tool that is helping, um, helping to support your design. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, here's a really good question. How can we create spaces that are equitable and accessible for all where everyone feels a sense of belonging? This is for anyone on our panel. I'll take that. I think it depends on the space, right? Um, I think there needs to be a <laughs> God, there's, there's a lot to say on that. Um, but I think that really listening to community helps you make the best decision for that particular community. And I think what has we've kind of struggled with is trying to assign and prescribe the same solutions to very different contexts and very different communities and neighborhoods. And so I would say listening would be the first 
the first piece and making time for that, whether that's kind of budgeting money um, or scheduling time um, or having staff to, to do that, um, but listening. Can I uh, just add to what Subhane just said? Um, so incorporating the integrated project design method by bringing everyone to the table and hearing everyone's voice in the design process so that you don't make those repeat mistakes or mm -hmm. um, you know, repeat designs that don't work for different groups of people. That's great, thank you. So here's another question. I'm in high school, grade nine, and I'm currently taking a tech design class. Can you explain what a design brief is? Oh, yeah. That's basically the problem question. If you want, if you want to say it that way, it's say, okay, um, what are the goals? The uh, what's the vision? What's the challenge? And what's the opportunity to create a space, solve a problem, uh, do a, a civic intervention? So basically, it's it's the challenge. What's the, what's the main question you're trying to solve? Thank you. And this again is for any of our panelists. What particular projects are you most proud of? I'm going to go first because it okay. was built. Um, it was built more more recently. Um, a project called Child Safe. I used to work at Overland Partners, which is an architectural firm in San Antonio, and it's a nonprofit children's advocacy center. So it's a seventy no sixty three thousand square foot facility that um, provided services or provides services to children who have been um, exposed to neglect or abuse in that particular county. And so it was really about a creating a space for healing, but also a space for various services. And I had a larger component that opened up to the outdoors to, um, to also really faci facilitate secondhand trauma healing from the people that were um, staffed there. So that it's, it's an unfortunate project that it needs to exist, but I'm proud of um, the ways in which funding showed up to support the program. Mm -hmm. Anyone else wanna share an example of a project you're proud of? Yeah, I'll, I'll say that um, a few years ago, I, I worked at a previous firm where we partnered with with actually Mass Design and uh, did the master plan and the design for a brand new university in Rwanda. Um, and it's a, a beautiful site. And we were really careful to be um, uh, sensitive and um, respectful mm -hmm. of the site. So we did a lot of indoor, outdoor type spaces. And this university is training new doctors and nurses. And it's, uh, it's, it's amazing. So if anyone wants to look it up, it's uh, just Google UGHE. And uh, it, 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 it meets a lot of the, the design brief objectives that we were after. So it's pretty cool. Okay, um, we'll move on to the next question. Um, <clears throat> this is for all architects. How did the coronavirus pandemic change you as an architect? Can I answer that question from an engineering standpoint? Sure. Um, so one of the areas that we focus on in Albadas is indoor air quality. And obviously with the COVID uh, pandemic that has become more of a forefront issue. So definitely, um, bringing that awareness also to everybody else, because in the past, indoor air quality was not really a topic of excessive and exhaustive discussion and was pretty much secondary. And now it's um, becoming more of an importance. Additionally, uh, getting away from mechanical ventilation and having mixed mode ventilation, because a lot of the codes are written in a way where they're, they're really discouraging of mixed mode ventilation. And it's all the buildings are far more mechanically ventilated, which is a problem. Uh, and with COVID, we're seeing that also being more of a problem now. Does anyone else have a perspective you'd like to share about how uh, the virus has changed your role as an architect? I'm gonna say yes about, uh, so community, I, I, I help promote community engagement and it's really a challenge um, to bring people together in, in time of physical separation mm -hmm. to talk about um, 
kind of what they want to prioritize for different types of design, particularly the, the design of a public space, right, when we aren't supposed to be gathering. So how are we even talking about that? Um, but also asking for community members time in the midst of a pandemic when their priorities have shifted, right? So it's about being hypersensitive to that and then also understanding that community engagement wasn't ideal pre-pandemic. And so we need to be able to diversify our ability to engage with people. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I guess we'll move on to another question. Um, what architecture books would you suggest to aspiring architects? Does anyone have any recommendations? Any book by Francis D.K. Ching. Um, he, he actually draws everything out by hand and it, it's amazing. So look that up and I, you could learn so much from that book. Great. We have any other book recommendations from our panel? So I actually use the Architecture Studio Companion, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> so that, that could be another book. Mm -hmm. But I'm not an architect. <laughs> okay, well, I have one other question here. Um, were you all good students in high school? Is it important to get good grades in school? Are there certain subjects you would suggest? That's for anyone on the panel. Um, <laughs> um, I would say grades and are important depending on the uh, college or university that you want to go to. Um, and I think that just matters with any college or career that you want to go into. Um, I made the mistake of not focusing on my grades when I was in high school. Um, and that did not give me the option to choose where I really wanted to go um, when I graduated high school. Um, and I went to another great college, but um, it wasn't for me. And I had to take a year off, um, which was great, but I did take a year off um, and I did kind of reset. And then I applied to the school that I really wanted to go to. Um, and I got accepted. So I would say if you if you are thinking about it now and you are earlier on in your uh, high school, your middle school or high school, your grades do matter. <laughs> um, so definitely make sure to, to focus on that. And then if um, there are classes, creative classes in the arts or technical classes that are offered or even electives, definitely take them. Because um, I think it'll just give you a window and some insight into the field um, and, and better prepare you for what you'll get into into college or school. Yeah, I'll just add two, two other things. One is um, communication skills are really important. So if you can find ways of getting advanced, you know, reading, writing or presentation skills, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that will be very helpful when you get to college math is not as important as people think it is for architecture school um but uh communication is is really important you're going to get bombarded with all these kind of words that you've never heard before and <laughs> being able to just understand what those mean and and and, and be able, able to express yourself and your ideas um allows you to, to move faster through the process and and Many times architecture studio can be very competitive. So, you know, sports and other types of social activities in school will be helpful to give you self-confidence to be able to present in front of the studio class and things like that. Yep. I'm wondering, James, do you have any questions for the architects just thinking about your project? Um, I mean, that, this has been, really really insightful i mean it's uh just honestly gerard like what you spoke of earlier about about uh just analyzing light and how it affects spaces i mean i've and really this is more like re in my residential homes i've i've uh really re come to realize that light makes all the difference you know so i actually just having retired from new england moved back down to philadelphia where i'm from and that whole um, that whole endeavor of finding a house, it really just came down to light. And that's mm. really like what, what made our 
we were kind of between a couple homes and we ended up finding the one that had the best natural light. Yeah. Um, I mean, you guys, you guys have been inspirational. I, I, I will take um, so much of what you said tonight into consideration. I mean, about affecting the community, um, you know, going beyond my ego and, and kind of just, you know, turning the mirror around and, and really kind of just taking the, taking the scope of the entire um, area that I plan on doing this in, which is outside of Philadelphia, um, and really just trying to provide and be an asset to the community for, for people to come and, and better themselves and, and hopefully better the, the community in turn. So thank you so much for you guys' time. This has been awesome. Um, you know, I, I started off, a funny little story, I started off in, uh, in high school really loving architecture. I wanted to be an architect. I wanted to, to uh, study architecture in school. Football kind of, you know, changed the, the direction of where I ended up going to school. Went to Brown, they didn't really have architecture. I would have had to take classes at RISD down, down the hill. So mm -hmm. with football, that, that made it complicated with my time. So I ended up going into mechanical engineering, which was, which was great. Um, but architecture always was my first love. So um, it's, it's really cool to hear you guys speak. And because I, uh, I can think back to when I was, you know, 17 year old kid in high school, you know, having the same, the same passions about space and building things and really understanding construction and so thank you guys for for relighting that fire in me and um you know this has been awesome so thank you thank you james you also got a shout out from somebody saying philly so yeah. <laughs> you got some philly fans <laughs> out there there you go all right well it is getting a little late for our architects and students on the, the East Coast, um, but we do hope, so I just wanna say thank you so much. I feel like my mind is like blown by just all of the, the stories that we heard today and just kind of the different perspectives. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we will be, um, so thank you to all the panelists, obviously thank you to James and to our students from Wentworth and it's Jenna who uh, who mentors for ACE mentor program. Sorry, I said that wrong earlier. <laughs> and thank you Heather for also being here. Um, we're gonna be doing another webinar in February. Uh, we're gonna be thinking about how to make it work. So you've you know played with an idea, you've you know shown thought about like the, the show and feel of you know the vision that you have that you want to, to share for James. And, and next we're gonna think about how to make it work. So do keep working on your projects. Uh, they're due uh, January 31st, so please get them out there. James is looking at them and he's really uh, inspired by all of your ideas. Um, so thank you so much. And please, you know, check out um, the autodesk.com slash autodesk make it real <laughs> in order to, to get updates because I know that you're looking for that as well. So thank you and thank you, uh, Professor Trabor as well for uh, sharing your students with us tonight too. And, and also, also Boss Noma too. <laughs> All right, so take care. Have a good night, everyone. We're gonna sign off. Thank you.